Well, the decade plus drought is officially over. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers will be oh, yes. bringing back the creamsicle uniforms October 15th against the Lions. How about it? I saw I that. Wait. I thought it was a great way to bring it back. Um, the, hey, listen, wait, why would you wait until Tom Brady leaves? I, I guess well, it's got to be the one thing to get get the fans excited. Again. I was just going to say <laughs> they're going to be such hot garbage this year. And um, Baker Mayfield is going to look so thick in that creamsicle. He's going <laughs> to look, uh, look real thick. Uh, and, um, and, you know, against the old NFC Central rivals, the Detroit Lions. Yeah. Um, if for all those young viewers out there didn't realize that, yeah, the, the Bucks used to be in the NL Central, it was called. And uh, it would, was p- played against the Lions, the Bears, the Vikings, the Packers. And not uh, the Chicago Cubs. It fe- yeah, Cubs. yeah. It feels like a long, it feels like a long, long time ago. And it was, but, uh, but uh, I think it's fun. I can't wait for it. And anything to get more excited for Lions games this year. Yeah, there the you Lions go, too. Get everyone's true. best shot. They're getting opening weekend. They're getting uh, the. But Tampa and the creamsicles, everyone's come giving the best shot to the liking to the, the uh to the uh to the the lions. <laughs> like Tampa and the creamsicles. That sounds like a really bad um like Jimmy Buffett cover band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like we are Tampa and the creamsicles. creamsicles. <laughs> it's fu- it's four o'clock somewhere with Tampa and the creamsicles. <laughs> Yeah, but it's the first time since 2012, so congratulations to Tampa and the fans. Uh, we got an exciting show here for you today, uh, largely talking with Max Markham uh, about the Chicago Bears. He does NFL content creation uh, largely on Twitter, so uh, you know he's been you know day and night uh, tweeting about Justin Fields primarily and, and getting into it and kind of combating some of those box score watchers on Twitter, so... Uh, He's got some interesting insight into the team this year. So really looking forward to that interview coming up here shortly. Uh, But first, Mark, uh, we'll kind of touch on a couple uh, news and notes from around the league, as we always do to kind of, you know, uh, begin our shows here. Biggest one being uh, in Minnesota, the, you know, Vikings uh, releasing Dalvin Cook after they couldn't find a trade partner post, uh, you know, this was already past the, uh, the, the June one designation period. So they were hoping to, find a trade partner to take all of the salary from them, but they're going to take a, a couple million cap hit because of the release. But Dalvin cook now looking for a new home. And he has said Mark that he wants a significant contract. Uh, unlike what was, you know, reportedly being just l- a little bit above the vet minimum that some teams might be willing to pay, but you know, he's, he's not getting any older. I think he's going to be turning 28 this season, but obviously a very capable running back. And, you know, one of the better ones in the league. He belongs in Denver with the Broncos. It makes all the sense in the world. They are could absolutely see it. They are in a, a mode right now where they have got to win. They've got to like turn the juju around and get the get this bad vibes out of the locker room. Bringing in a weapon like him, um, and and giving him a contract to just be like, we need you to play the Alvin Kamara role a little bit in the Sean Payton offense. He's a bigger, more between the tackles version of that. I I think um, if I was a Denver Broncos fan, I'd be tweeting at him every day, go get Dalvin cook. And I'd be tweeting at Dalvin cook. Think about Denver. Think about Denver. Think about Denver. Um, There's a couple other places that make sense to me. That's the one where I feel like they would be willing to maybe give him more money because they're in a little bit of a desperate mode to make it work and make it work quickly. Uh, but if you're one of those teams out there like a Carolina or a Houston with a a, a young quarterback uh, that needs this to work, I also could see them, you know, spend a little bit more money on him just to bring him in to help your guy for the first year or two of his career. Those are the places that jumped in my head. You know, the Bills maybe, but the Vi- this like the Chiefs, like you go to the big name teams, the, the Chargers, they probably don't want to overpay. They're in a spot where having him would be a luxury, and if he's willing to take a small contract, great. Makes all the sense in the world. But 
if he's looking to actually get money and he's not going to just take a, a vet minimum, those are the teams I could see maybe paying more than the vet minimum. Don't you think? I could, yeah, I could, I mean, I could certainly see them paying that probably Houston more so than Carolina, just because Carolina uh, signed Miles Sanders to a, a three-year contract, True. but it wasn't, you know, it, it didn't knock your socks off. And then I'm sure they can get out of that contract. You know, if they wanted to beef up that room a little bit, they did lose Deontay Foreman and it's not like they've got a, a dominant backfield. So that would, that would certainly help. Damian Pierce was obviously like really good last year as a rookie, but there's a lot of questions about whether or not like the, that the Texans and obviously with, you know, a new head coach, that regime, like if they're, if that's the route they want to go, Dalvin cook would obviously be an upgrade uh, over Pierce, even though Pierce, you know, did play well when he had the chance. So I could, I could definitely see that another area that I would think could be a plausible landing spot, depending on the situation, because truthfully, I don't know if the Rams believe they can still make another run at this thing or if they are truly committed to just, you know, just tearing it all down. I feel like having Matt Stafford where he's at, they can't really get out of this situation, the contract. I feel like they have to try and just make another run. And and I, I don't think, you know, some people think they, they're going to be the worst team in the league. I really don't think that's going to be the case this year. No, I, I, You know, last year was about as bad as it, it, it could get for them. I know they then have lost some people, five, but, six games. but you know, they've, they've struggled with health at the running back position. Cam Akers has been good when he's healthy and when he's gotten certain opportunities, but you just don't really know how comfortable you're, you are with him being the guy. Yeah. And other, other than that, it's a, you know, it's kind of a cast of no names there in Los Angeles. So I could see Delvin cook being a really good option and fit for, for what they would need there uh, in LA. But Again, you know, the Broncos do make a lot of sense, too. I would just feel so bad for Samaj P. Ryan, who finally got out of the shadow of Joe Mixon, was hoping to finally like take on like a three-down workload, and, it, you know, it could be possible that he's instantly relegated to backup duties once again. Yeah, I I, I mean, you make a lot of sense. I, I kind of forgot about Miles Sanders, to be honest, a little bit. But um, but they I, still uh, do need depth. I mean, if, if Carolina had the money and the wherewithal, I, 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 that wouldn't be a bad signing because yeah, I mean, Miles I mean, Sanders could loading up on your be run a good game. change of pace guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, loading up on your run game for your young quarterback you just uh, you know took number one overall. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think the market will be – it's weird. We're, it's just still weird that we're in this spot where, like, a star running back who just had his second most rushing yards ever in his career – is still under 28 would, you know, still like you feel like has a two or three years left, you know, cause it's still to me like 30 is the age where it's like, ew. Um, yeah, where you start to fall off for sure. But you don't, I mean, it, it's so hard because you get guys who show up like Pierce who are no name and you rush them and they have a thousand yards. So it's a, um, it's a weird spot for uh cook to be in. And it's a weird spot to me. It says more about the Vikings. Now that Daniel Hunter news is coming on out that he's planning to hold out because he wants a new deal and the team doesn't feel good about it, that he's 28 entering the final year of his contract that he signed in 2018. You know, it seems like the Vikings are just overall as a roster, like what are the moves they're making and what are they saying to their own fan base? Um, it feels like you give Kirk Cousins $35 million, you just need to pay everyone and go all in. And you yeah, need to keep I, Cook. It, and it you need to bizarre, keep Hunter. Or... And it and and make these guys happy for this one, you know, kind of final year run with Kirk with no bad man in your division now. And they're not doing that. And and, and all signs I'm seeing are pointing to Daniel Hunter could be very well be on the trade block. And if that's the case, I, I just don't know what Minnesota's doing overall. Uh I know we'll talk a little bit about that with Max I don't know if I could name player. a defensive player after if if Daniel Hunter's not there and you know Harrison Smith, like outside of those guys, like their defense yeah, from, from five gone. years ago, which was like the best defense in the league yeah. like five or six years ago, or one of the best, uh, they, they've certainly fallen off. And they let, like, and they moved down from Smith as well as Darius Smith after a year. Yep, so, yep. um, yeah, it's no more Kendricks. So uh, well, I will say this. I do think in a weird way, the fact they have cook and Hopkins on the market right now, and it's not like a sizzling hot market for either of them feels bizarre it feels very if you would have told me seven months ago in the middle of the last nfl season 
that in the offseason, Cook and Hopkins would become free agents, I would have been like, oh, they're getting gobbled up right away. But so much of this, what happens post-draft is teams, exactly. teams just feel like they want to give their draft picks a chance. They want to see how it all works out. But I do believe firmly that both of those guys, Hopkins and Hunter, will have deals. I mean, Hopkins and Cook will have deals before the start of the season, before training camp. Like I, It'll get done. It's just a, a mix of what they want and what the teams that are interested want in return, you know, what they're willing to pay. Yeah, sticking with the position, Saquon Barkley has not signed his franchise tag, and he is not yeah. uh, play, going to be attending mandatory minicamp. Uh, he did make a statement saying that he's not looking to set records. Uh, he knows – uh, you, the, you know, the state of the NFL when it comes to running back contracts, right. but he does, you know, want to be fairly compensated for the performances that he believes he brings and, and the importance that he brings to this team. So right now we're in a holding pattern. I'm not sure what this means for New York. I'm not sure what this means for Saquon. I don't know if this is going to be another Le'Veon Bell type situation where, you know, Bell was obviously probably – a little bit stronger in his stance. Saquon has already said he doesn't want to, you know, be a, a trendsetter for running backs. Yeah. So he's probably a little bit more willing, I think, than, you know, Le'Veon obviously wanted those the guarantees. Um, but I am curious if Saquon's willing to actually sit out the season if they're not able to come to a, you know, consensus, especially because he's only had one year post, you know, the injuries. And so last year he played great, but does he really want to take like another – year off when he's already missed some time for all of these injuries in, in previous years. And he's also not getting any younger either. Yeah. He had a, you gotta remember he was a second overall pick. So he had a nice yeah. contract. Like he's not hurting for money. I get the sense though, that he will at the 11th hour, but when push comes to shove, you know, a week before the season starts, if the holdouts going that long, he'll sign the contract and he'll play the under the tag. Cause that's 10 million guaranteed a lot of money it is a a chance for him to, to just rest his body do what he feels he needs to do can plug right back into the offense it's not going to miss a beat and he's going to make he's going to try to put the pressure on the giants to watch daniel jones struggle all camp and watch him throw interceptions and watch him not be able to just to turn challenge give the ball to oh did you hear that I did hear that. I don't know. What Sorry, that was weird. I'm on ESPN right now, and it just like popped it. <laughs> the they ad, auto play those ads. Man. The yeah. auto ad popped up because I'm looking at the Daniil Hunter situation. I'll I'll close out of that. Uh, and so uh, don't sue us, YouTube. We didn't and we inadvertently <laughs> played that two seconds of of ad audio. But I do think that he, listen, he is in a unique spot because. The Giants backed themselves into a corner and they made the wrong decision signing Daniel Jones to the deal he signed. No one else in the NFL was going to sign Daniel Jones to a deal even close to that. They negotiated against themselves. They put themselves in a bad position. Now Saquon has all the power. So it's like, if you want Daniel Jones to look good this year, sign me to a deal. And if you can't sign me to a deal because you signed Daniel Jones, well, then guess what? I will make Daniel Jones look really bad and make you look really bad by not playing football. So it's going to be come to a, a head. If he can't get the deal he wants, so I do think he'll just sign the franchise tag. The most important thing for him, him at this point is staying healthy through the start of the mm -hmm. season. Because if he can tweak something in, in training camp after signing the contract, that's in, that puts him in a real bad spot as well for his future earnings. Uh, but $10 million guaranteed is nothing to scoff at. Uh, even if he gets injured week one, he gets that money signing the franchise tag. I think he knows that that adds a lot of extra money to your family, to your career earnings, $10 million. So um, he is worth more. He's worth more, especially to that franchise now. And I think the Giants hopefully will come to some sort of agreement with Saquon and keep him tied to at least the Daniel Jones era. If you're going to have Daniel Jones, your starting quarterback, I think you need to tie Saquon as his running back and his safety blanket and him being the guy that you can run the offense through to help Daniel Jones. And if you're Saquon, you say to yourself, well, I'm going to hopefully put up some giant numbers and I'm going to get paid and I'm going to, you know, be able to retire as a Giants Hall of Famer or whatever it might be. 
and uh, and that and have a pretty good career living easy in New York for the rest of my life as a beloved athlete. Um, yeah. I, it's not a bad way to go about it. So that's my thought on it. I'd be shocked if Saquon's actually missing games at the start of the year. We talked about DeAndre Hopkins a little bit earlier. Uh, some news this past week that he is yeah. set to meet with the Patriots this week. You know, people brought up the connection with Bill O'Brien, uh, given that, you know, that was his head coach for several years over there in Houston, uh, seemed to have a good relationship. And now Bill O'Brien, obviously the offensive coordinator there in New England. Uh, do, do you make anything of this uh, meeting with the Patriots? I mean, obviously he's only met with a couple teams. Uh, I believe Tennessee was only one who met with Tennessee. Tennessee, that's right, that's right. That was the other one. So really, uh, from my perspective, two teams that I didn't anticipate DeAndre Hopkins wanting to go to. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's also, maybe it's a case of these were the only meetings he could get. Um, you know, so I'm not really sure. I mean, obviously, there's got to be a market for the guy. But then again, you know, what What are teams willing to pay? And a lot of teams, as you mentioned, post-draft, feel they have their rooms in order. I think that it's a... Smart move for him to take these meetings. The Tennessee meeting makes sense. They need him, so that sends a message to other teams. Dang, okay, that's a desperate team that would sign him. Uh, and then the the New England team, again, makes sense because exactly what you said, Bill Bryant, if I'm the Bills, if I'm another team that really wants Hopkins on maybe a, a, a team-friendly deal, you can say, crap, he has a great connection there. He's going to go right back to Bill O'Brien. He knows that offense. And they're going to feed him the rock, um, just like Matt Schaub did for all those years. I mean, a very similar situation as far as the, you know, the quarterback relationship um, um, or early in his career. I shouldn't say all those years, but early in, in Hopkins' career at the end of the Schaub era before uh, Deshaun Watson. Um, if I'm Deshaun, if, I, if I'm Watson, sorry, if I'm Hopkins, I take as many as I can get. I think it's good press. Keep your name in the media. You keeps putting pressure on other teams. And realistically, it sounds like Hopkins just wants as much money as he can get. He, I, he, you know, he has the quote in the podcast saying he wants to catch passes from these guys. Okay. Well then your first two meetings are with Ryan Tannehill and Mac Jones. It's yeah, not exactly yeah, yeah. Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen uh, and, uh, and the other guys that you mentioned. So actions speak louder than words in, in that, in that point. So I think that uh, money's going to talk with D Hop, and if you have money and you want D Hop, he's available. Go get him. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's a pr- of the premier. Two, I'd go to New England. Of the two, I'd go to New England. Hundred percent. Yeah, agreed. You know, agreed. The there's a more culture and, fit. And Mac Jones, right now, is more just capable. I think of putting the ball in a spot where you can just go make plays as the playmaker you are versus Tannehill. Well, yeah, and and you know, in New England, you will be the guy. Whereas, yes, in Tennessee, you still Juju. would be, but Traylon Burks at least uh, is a very ascending player that they yeah. hope can be AJ Brown level. Uh, I don't think you know Juju's really at that point in his career, and he's much more of a slot guy. D Hop wouldn't have to compete as much uh, in New England for those targets. Uh, finally, before we get to the interview, real quick, just a couple notes here: the Broncos signed Frank Clark, the you know, veteran uh, edge rusher. Uh, so that's, you know, to help bolster yeah. that, uh, you know, pass rush. And Bryce Young was officially elevated to the number one quarterback slot. So that took all of about two weeks there in Carolina. Anything to, to say on those sorry, two? Andy. Uh, sorry, Andy. Nice guy, Andy Dalton. Nice yeah, guy. Yeah. Um, so close. But, um, the Clark move to me is a little bit of a sting if you're a Chiefs fan. I think there was maybe some hope that he would just kind of come back on a veteran deal and want to just stay there and ride it out. But now he goes to a division rival who really could use that extra situational pass rusher that he is. And Clark is a guy that really helped get Carl office. And I have a diehard chiefs fan here in my office. And I trust him when he said, he's like, listen, Clark, really help mentor the young guys and get him going. So uh, he, if he's willing to take on that role in Denver as well and knows the Chiefs offense, it's a nice signing for, for Denver, for sure, as a situational pass rusher. You know, I, I just said with the, the Cook thing, Denver needs to turn this thing around quickly. Like, they need this thing to work. They need If there's one team that, like, needs a playoff run next year, it's the Denver Broncos. Like, they need it. They really do. Um, and so 
And so uh, anything, I think it, it, it helps them achieve that goal. And so I think it's a good move in that way. Um, I will say one thing uh, right now before we get into the interview, and I, you're about to set it on up. So I just want to say one thing. Max is a, a, a great Twitter follow. Give him a give him a follow on Twitter. Max Markham NFL on Twitter. Really fun. If you're not a Bears fan and you listen to the show and you want to kind of stay in touch with like where uh, my Bears fandom meets like defending the line on Twitter, Max is a great uh, is a great uh, way to kind of look into. Yes, I agree. You're going to hear that a lot in the interview. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy. Give them a follow on Twitter. If you're not a Bears fan, or if you are a Bears fan and you want someone who you can just let the retweets do the talking, you retweet something he posts to give out all the good information. He will help you defend your point all season long. That's for sure. A great resource, no doubt about it. So let's get to it. Without further ado, here's our interview with Max Markham. All right, pleased to be joined by Max Markham, an NFL content creator focusing largely on the Chicago Bears. So obviously, with Mark being here, we uh, we know this is an exciting one for sure to get to talk some Bears and uh, and kind of get a, a, a glimpse at what it's like. I, I, I noticed, Max, you know, you've uh, you've become, you know, pretty Twitter famous for your Justin Fields uh, takes and tweets some some really good stuff there. Um, so. Uh, Mark, you being the resident, you know, Bears fan here on the show, I will let you fire away, start this thing off. What do you got for Max? Well, I, you know, I love, I love Max's content, been following him for a while here now, and, and we're glad to get him on the show. And I, I want to start with Max. First and foremost, it, will my national nightmare be over as Bears fans? Will we have a 4,000 yard passer by the end of the season? By de- by this time next year, if we're talking to you, will we be talking about a franchise that has a 4,000 yard passer in a season with Justin Fields yeah absolutely I I think a huge thing it comes down to is like accessibility did the Justin Fields have like the opportunity to get to 4,000 yards last year like you take the best seasons from Mooney Quinn uh Equinemi St. Brown Dante Pettis uh Chase Claypool we had a couple games with but it was would be very difficult for a young quarterback to get, reach a 4,000 yards with those guys as your starting wide receiver core so I just think there's just so much opportunity this year. And I think a large part of it goes back to his college days. Like he was known for his passing. He was known for his accuracy. He wasn't really known for running at all. And last year he had to run because he was constantly on the move from collapsing pressure. He had uh, wide receivers that weren't necessarily giving him the separation he was looking for. And so I think, yeah, having DJ Moore, Chase Claypool back and healthy, Darnell Mooney back and healthy, uh, perhaps Tyler Scott can contribute. I think if we think Justin Fields is uh, elite of a quarterback as we claim to be, he should be reaching 4,000 or getting it very close to it this year. Well, kind of going off of that uh, with the, the you know, uh, surrounding cast that he has there, you know, one of your biggest tweets, I remember seeing it in December and I believe it's still, uh, you know, pinned to your profile. So those uh, who want to go check it out, definitely go there at Max Markham NFL, but it's, really cool because it kind of puts the box score watchers on blast. Yeah. Uh, I think the tweet was how uh, there was that meme going around about how Justin Fields isn't in the clutch. And then you kind of showed a breakdown of all of the situations that they outlined in that meme and uh, kind of showing that clearly Justin Fields was not at fault for literally any of those that they mentioned. Just uh, g- give your take on like probably how nauseating it's been to see the anti Justin Field takes over the last year and a half from people really there weren't that many at the start, but since he actually gained, you know, some notoriety with his rushing ability, now all of a sudden they're all coming out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it was definitely a very interesting season for Justin in the sense that he took off around week six, I want to say against the Patriots. Sorry. What was that? Yeah. Monday night against new England. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of where everything exploded. And then from there, he had about six straight weeks of just, um, I don't know, borderline MVP play. Like he was just playing at that level with no talent around him. Uh, He was breaking records left and right. He broke uh, about a dozen records, including Chicago's own, but uh, many NFL records and not just rushing records. There was multiple like um, passing touchdown, rushing touchdown, 
um, sort of combined uh, um, sort of games that he had. And so I think a big thing that what we are trying to combat over here on Twitter is just that he is a running back rather than a quarterback. And I think statistically, if you check things out, yeah, his passing yards are low um, and his rushing yards are high. And I think going back, is this consistent with his characteristics from college? Can he throw the ball? And for sure, there's things he needs to work on. There's ways he needs to improve. And if he doesn't get around 4,000 yards this season, considering everybody's healthy, that's when, for me, I'll start to consider is Justin Fields the guy that we want to have going forward? Because I think in order to have sustained success in the NFL, you do need to have a guy that can put put up massive passing yards. So um, I don't know. I, I I can see where some of the criticism is coming from, but I think right. if you look deeper into the play-by-play analysis, then you need to consider, okay, Justin Fields maybe did have some cast issues. Yeah, well, so, so much of it, I, I love what you said there. Going off of that is that, you know, Justin Fields did what he had to do to kind of survive and pop in the NFL. But I also think part of the whole conversation of is Justin Fields the guy really so much of it swelled as soon as the season was ending and you have all of the first takes of the world and ESPNs of the world having to fill the content of, oh, well, the Bears have the first pick. So should they, whenever you have the first pick, it relies on that whole, will they take a quarterback? And is and that's why I love the Bears made the move with the Panthers as early as they did in the off season. I think it was like the earliest first time of, of the, the, that a first overall pick was traded is because it sent the message to the rest of the league. Like uh, enough of this, like we're done hearing this type of conversation, go back to what your reaction was like when the bears traded the number one overall pick. Did you like the move? Did you love the move? And then what was like, did you think they got enough or were you, one of those people, I, I've combated a lot of those people on Twitter, like they should have held out and traded to like three and then traded again and then traded again. It's like, wait, wait, wait. As soon as you can get DJ Moore, the trade's done. That was, yeah. that was in my opinion. What about you, Max? Yeah, I think a big thing is just even looking back to the wide receivers available in free agency. There's not a lot of star guys that become yeah. available. So when you get an opportunity to get someone like DJ Moore and help out Justin Fields, and uh, add a future like he's got a he's got a great contract. He, I think he's available for to us for another three years. And I forget how, what his AAV is, but we're not paying him a whole lot. And no. uh, I think I think initially, like I, I was stoked. I'm I was glad to get the deal done. Um, my one sort of issue may have been just that 2025 second round pick. I, w- I was really hoping for our first there. But beyond that, I, I think it was a great move by polls. And I think um I think he had some great comments on it as well. Like you don't want to just hold on to it for so long. If you have the value exceeded that you were expecting and which for polls, it was exceeded and you can hold out for more possibly, but what if the Panthers are like, you know what? We don't want to risk it. We want to go into the the season with a young quarterback. So we're going to actually shift focus to trading for, I don't know, Zach Wilson for, a mid round pick, something like that. And we're going to try and develop someone else because we're not going to hold up for too long. And then also now opportunities passed up. So I think ultimately I'm like, I was very pumped. I was pumped that they got it done early and uh, to add another weapon for Justin Fields. Like, yeah, obviously that can't be overlooked. Yeah. Well, you know, for the most part, since, you know, the post lovey Smith, it's kind of been a shit show at the head coaching, you know, position there for yeah. the last decade. Plus I'm curious your thoughts so you know, we mentioned Ryan Poles and kind of the moves he's made. So in terms of the regime itself, this Eberflus, Ryan Poles era, what are your thoughts, you know, early on? Obviously we can't paint like a, a complete picture. Uh, it's only been one season, but your overall thoughts on what you've seen, what you like, maybe what you dislike from this duo and maybe where you forecast um, them going in the years to come. Do you, do you sense that this might be a a duo that's here to stay for at least a a little while longer than most. Yeah. uh, I'll just start off with Ryan Poles. I am excited about the culture that he's building. I think he brought in a good guy in Matt Eberflus. I think um, he's obviously got a vision and a plan and a plan that was better than most because the bears interviewed, I don't know how many people it was like about a dozen people for their GM position and, uh, and really took their time on it. And then Ryan Poles, he was very excited about, joining the bears as well. So, uh, he, he, like, he skipped his interviews with the Vikings and, um, and just said like, I'm going to accept this position as soon as it's offered. 
So I, I'm really liking Ryan Poles. Uh, he's taking a slow approach. And obviously, uh, for me, I, I want a little, a little bit um, more of a quicker pace, like uh, with free agency. I think it was a little bit da dangerous to go into the draft with just some very large holes on our offensive line. Um, of course, we filled it in Darnell Wright and Nate Davis uh, should be a good, good guard as well. So, uh, so far, so good. I, I don't mind the slow approach. We still have a lot of cap less, uh, left over from next year, of course, the two first round picks. So uh, he's got a lot of opportunity to work. Now, moving on to Matt Eberflus. Ah, it, I, I love the guy. Like he, he's just such a good, I don't know. He, he's, he's got a good handle on what, um, the team seems to be at right now. Like he seems to put down uh, his foot where he wants um, his character to, to shine through and that sort of thing. So obviously we're skipping over guys like Jalen Carter because we're going for culture fit. We're going, going for good guys. Um, and, but my issue will always come back to is that he is a defensive guy and you look at a lot of the success in the league. Of course, there's some outliers like with Mike Tomlin from the Steelers and there's um, Bill Belichick. So some of the greats, but for the most part, it's uh, offensive guys with who will become head coaches with offensive quarterbacks, and then they maintain this relationship long term. And uh, of course, we have Josh Allen, who maybe had a bit of a down year last year as soon as Brian Dable le leaves. And that's kind of my concern is that as soon as Justin Fields takes off, uh, Luke Getze is likely a head coaching candidate somewhere yeah. else. He takes off and now he's got to learn this whole new off offense, new language, new concept. Same with the wide receivers. They have to do, go through the same. And I do think that championships are built through a successful offense. So that would be my only concern. I do love Matt Eberflus. Um, I'm holding out hope, but I do think if it doesn't work out, we're all going to look back and say, like, this is what we get for hiring a defensive head coach. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you at all. I, I think you 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 nailed it there. I, I, I'm Everything about the Matt Eberflus, the guy and his connection to the players, I've only heard great things. I've only felt like even throughout the year, when the Bears were going along losing streak and it was like barreling towards being a top three pick and eventually getting the number one overall pick, being having the worst record, it, it never felt like he lost the locker room. It never felt like things got so out of hand or snowballed where he was, you know, in over his head, like you got that sense in Denver this year. Um, but I, I, the one thing I'd push back a little bit on, at least that I defended, you know, my problem is I'm eternal optimist with my own team. I can't be negative on them. I struggle so hard to be negative on my team is that I, I give him credit for saying like they made such a drastic change on that mini buy offensively. You know, they went in with a plan to start the year by week five. It wasn't working. They have this mini bye week after the, th you know, Thursday night game to Monday night, they completely revamped the offense and Justin Fields comes out there and starts becoming the most electric running quarterback. If he, if they build a culture, if Eberflus is able to build that type of culture, well, then maybe then that's something that as a defensive coach can really work where it's like, hey, I'm going to let my offensive guys get creative and tell them this ain't working. I think Dan, you detest one of the problems with the Steelers sometimes with the defensive culture is the offensive guy goes, oh, I just want complete hands off. And he believes in a guy like Matt Canada and the offense stays stale and he doesn't, you know, challenge him to get going from everything I read and saw. It felt like Ibraflus was a little bit of the, the pushing factor of like, we need to change something up. And that led the offense to to dive into you know this creating this new offense for the Bears heading into it. So I, I'm with you. It's tough. I, I'm absolutely. I was a huge a year ago. I was pushing Brian Dable. Brian Dable. You know what I mean. Two or two years ago, whenever during that that hiring uh, that hiring spree. So I'm I'm with you there. I I, I want to turn to this though. Moving on from Justin Fields a little bit. You mentioned Nate Davis. You mentioned Darnell Wright. Offensive lineup grades. So in part of becoming a 4,000 yard passer is the supporting cast offensively. Um, did they do enough? Is Cody Whitehair your starting center? Is that enough? Do you feel good about enough about the rest of the supporting cast to be like, Hey, you know what? This is a, this is an offense that can help our guy become a 4,000 yard passer and, and an offense that elevates what he does well. Yeah. I'm at the point where there's no excuses for Justin Fields this year. Okay. Um, I do think, think that Cody White like I was really hoping for a center with that second round pick we ended up taking uh Tyreek Stevenson I believe that was the pick when there was guys like uh, John Michael Schmitz available um so I don't know I I think we will see 
Um, but one thing I really go back to is that Sam Mustafer is not snapping the ball this year. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like at, Cody Whitehair, he might not be the best center, but I think he should just be such a large upgrade to yeah. uh, over Sam Mustafer that that's going to be um, a huge gap up. And then I think an even bigger gap up would be going from Larry Borum to Darnell Wright, who I think should explode onto the scene next year, make a main name for himself. Um, I forget who it was, who was saying it, but there was a NFL guy. Um, it was Corey Wooten, maybe. I don't want to attribute to the wrong guy, but I believe he was saying that he expects um, Darnell Wright to be in the Pro Bowl conversation after his rookie year. I, he he yeah. says he's going to be that good. He's such a huge guy who moves so fluidly. So I think uh, that's going to be great. Uh, Braxton Jones um, holding out hope that he's going to take another step. I, I'm excited for his development. Tevin Jenkins, I, I just love watching the guy play. He, he's the most exciting guy to watch on the entire offensive line, yeah. in my opinion. So when healthy he is, you're uh, absolutely yeah, right. Exactly, health is a huge issue. So I think I think wide or uh, sorry, offensive line. I think you're set. I think you've got decent depth with Lucas Patrick as your um, perhaps swing guard, also backup center, and then you have uh, Larry Borum perhaps as a swing tackle as well. So he, and he's not bad. He's yeah. just not good. Um, but then you have wide receivers that all, all three should be on the field starting like that. There's no guys that you think like Dante Pettis or uh, St. Brown, where it's like, man, these guys are borderline practice squad and they're starting. And uh, and then you have two really good passing uh, pass catching tight ends in Cole Komet and Robert Tunyon. So I think he's got more than enough weapons to work with and he should have a good year going forward. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about Cole Komet. I, I struggle with Cole Komet. I, I get very hot and cold with Cole Komet. And part of it is my own hate for Notre Dame. So I just, I, I have to like put that aside. I'm not a Notre Dame fan. So I have to like block out the fact that he went to a college I don't like. Because um, it's easy when he drops the ball for me. But like, Notre Dame guy, yeah. come on, he's went to Notre Dame. Um, but they are like tight on you uh, right there with the <laughs> Iowa for the most I part. Know. You know? It, it, for Max, in your opinion, to me, my biggest thing is I was a proponent pre-draft and 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 going into it. I like the Robert Tunyon signing actually a lot to add real depth to the position. But I'm one of those guys who I feel like the, the next step for the Bears offense is Cole Komet becoming tight end number two. Like if you want this offense to become – I mean, listen, adding DJ Moore is incredible – I think the Bears absolutely should be hoping the Panthers crumble and they can get Marvin Harrison Jr. at the top of the draft next year to add. Like, if you can add a Marvin Harrison Jr. and Darnell Mooney goes to wide receiver number three, um, I think – or getting Cole Komet to tight end number two because you look at the offenses that are so explosive right now in the NFL and you see Travis Kelsey and you see Kittle and you see, you know, a guy like a Mark Andrews. I mean, these, these tight ends that are catching – getting close to thousand yard receiving, you know, in, in 60 plus catches. I don't think Cole Komet is that guy. I, I truly don't believe it. I think he's a really, really nice tight end, but do you agree? Do you think if, if this offense takes the next step, it might not be the wide receiver position needs any more upgrades. It might be getting Cole Komet to be your blocking tight end slash red zone tight end number two. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you're you're right. Like uh, Robert Tunyon is more of your U tight end where he can go out and catch passes where Cole Komet's more in line. And and I think, uh, yeah, Ryan Poles has commented on that with emphasis that he really appreciates Cole Komet for his blocking and because he knows his assignments, because oh. he helps with the Bears' top rushing game in the league. And uh, whereas I think if you have Cole Komet on a running down or a running play where um, you could also have Robert Tunyon. I think there's a vast difference just from there. So we do have more of a run first offense uh, just through Luke Getze and, um, and the offense that he's kind of cultivated through his past experience. But I think, uh, I think you're right. I would not be surprised if Robert Tunyon comes out of this season with more passing or cat receiving yards than Cole Komet. And uh, of course we're ho hoping for the homegrown talent to take off, but um, we may just see him cap out at this about 500 yards, 400 yards, uh, catching a season where we need someone to kind of step in and be an additional weapon for fields. And honestly, that could be perfectly fine. I mean, we see a lot of teams in the, in the league that are able to excel without having, you know, a, a top flight tight end. There's probably a handful of them in the league, uh, right now. And there's still plenty of teams that are able to, you know, find success. So that's definitely, uh, you know, an area where they can, 
uh, you know, maybe just uh, lean in to some of these guys uh, in key downs or, you know, th- the third down converter, the red zone guy, but not have to put up outrageous numbers. I am curious. I'd like to switch gears to the backfield. Your thoughts on the David Montgomery departure for one and two, how you see this backfield shaping up. I mean, is it Khalil Herbert's job to lose? Is it going to be a complete committee with, you know, obviously the rookie Roshan Johnson in the mix. And then obviously Deontay Foreman, who's had a career renaissance. Curious your thoughts on how this backfield is going to shape up. Yeah. So I'll start with David Montgomery. It was disappointing when he left. Um, Ryan Poles publicly said, like, we gave a contract that was very similar, very in line with what the Lions offered. And he chose to go his own route. And perhaps they let him in on that DeAndre Swift maybe wasn't going to stick around because it did seem like David Montgomery was looking for more of an opportunity rather than splitting reps with Khalil Herbert. Uh, I feel bad for David Montgomery to a point too, because he ate a lot of dirty yards last year, a lot of um, third and short he was on the field for, and he did well. He got us those first downs, but um, I do think we are looking for a guy with a little bit of more of that home run speed. I know we've been saying that since Jordan Howard was our RB one, But uh, with David Montgomery leaving, I do think it allows for a little bit more opportunity with some of these agile guys. I think what I expect with this uh, running back room, I expect Khalil Herbert to start. I think he's going to do well. I think Deontay Foreman kind of takes the edge off a little bit and is more of that change of pace back. However, I think Roshan Johnson, we, we are all pumped about it about pumped about him being drafted to us. And, and he's got a lot of skills that we can use, but I think, it's just such a crowded back um, running back room right now that I think it's going to take a few weeks, perhaps even a month before Roshan Johnson starts to carve away at a role. So I firmly expect Khalil Herbert to be um, a bell cow of sorts. And then with Deonta Foreman coming in, filling in um, maybe some more of those dirty yards. And then, um, cause he's not, he's not much of a pass catching back. And I know they do like to have their running backs have a little bit of versatility there. And so I do think, Kind of maybe after the first quarter of the season, Roshan Johnson starts to eat away into a role with more of a pass catching. But I do think he's going to have a special teams role as well. So he's going to be on the field week one, yeah. um, having some sort of impact. Yeah, you asked the question, I think, on Twitter. And it, it was one of those where it's one of you, you think you know the answer immediately. And then you go, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. What is, it's like, who would lead the Bears in rushing between the four guys, Foreman, Herbert, Johnson, and then Fields? I believe I responded with Fields because I think in the end, I I don't think Fields is going to have nearly the rushing numbers he had last year, but I still think he's going to be somewhere around that 700, 800 yard mark. And I don't see Herbert Johnson or Foreman being a bell cow in the sense where they're going to eat. Any one of them is going to be a thousand yard rusher. I firmly believe by the end of the season, the starting running back, if the bears are in a, in a you know position to win a playoff game or in a, or near that, I I firmly believe everything I'm reading and seeing that Roshan Johnson could be the starting back by week. You know what I mean? Like if the Bears are in that position, do you feel that way as well, or is it or is I mean Herbert's a very straight line downhill runner. I like Herbert, but I just think versatility wise, when you have an a, a quarterback like Justin. You want the guy who's just going to maybe also be able to make an explosive play on the fly with him. And I, and I feel like that's Roshan Johnson. Yeah. That puts a smile on my face. That'd be such an exciting season. If the bears are in a playoff position by the end of the year and Roshan Johnson has very clearly become the RB one, like you just know you hit on that pick. I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm just such a um, callous fan where I'm just like, I've been hurt (laughs) so many times. I'm not expecting great things. Um, yeah, that happened right away. I I'd love Roshan Johnson. I think he was one of my favorite picks of the entire draft. I'm so happy that we got him and I believe it was late round four or something, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't expect great things, um, often. So I usually kind of temper my expectations. Uh, yeah. I, if that happens, I think that is the best case scenario. However, I do think Herbert, if he remains healthy, I think he kind of, and, and I don't know, I, I also want to hope that coaching is willing to adapt to the hot hand instead of just going with, okay, Herbert's our guy. Um, We're going to just stick with him, even though Roshan is clearly carving out a role. I hope they are that malleable. So we'll see as things go along, but there, yeah, we're run first offense um, for, so these running backs should have a lot of opportunity. I think, I think he's going to have a few reps going in um, maybe not early on in the season. Maybe he'll get a, um, 
uh, a play here or there, just maybe to hype the fans up that Roshan, because you remember even week one against the LA Rams last year, Justin Fields, he wasn't playing. He wasn't starting or sorry, two years ago. Um, he wasn't starting, but they got him in on the five yard line to run in a touchdown just to kind yeah. of like create, create a few headlines and that sort of thing. So maybe something like that happens where we give him a, a gadget play here and there, or maybe a, a touchdown opportunity, but I'm not expecting uh, for a movie type role or movie type season to happen. Um, but we hope for the best yeah, for as far as the, you know, we talked a lot about the rookie class here and I, we both believe strongly Darnell, right. I, th- I think, and I, and I even really, I have high hopes for, um, for the young wide receiver, Scott as well. I, I, I like his speed and I like his depth in that wide receiver room completely. I mean, he's very much a Darnell Mooney, you know, 2.0 type of w- way he plays. But looking at last year's rookie class, Ryan pulls his first draft class. Is there a guy that you're you're going to put money on? He say this is the guy in the sophomore year who's going to avoid the sophomore slump and have the pop year, like the type of year where it's like, oh, again, if the Bears are in playoff positioning in that you know week 17, 18, they're battling for a playoff spot. It's because hey, this sophomore really stepped up. Do you have do you have a name in mind who you're looking for a big sophomore season? Um, I would look at immediately to Braxton Jones, yep. um, stepping up and just solidifying himself. I think, I think one thing that we do as Bears fans is that we see this fifth round pick who's playing at a level where he's like looking like a starter. But I do think as a left tackle, your role is just that more significant to the, to the passer and just covering for his blind side, you know? So I do think if Braxton Jones takes that next step and not, I'm not even saying pro ball level, but just at a level where it's like, wow, he is not letting up much. You know, he's not the most violent guy, but they were talking about him putting on some more muscle, adding a little bit more strength, um, really firming up that anchor. So if he can help out with uh, um, some of the pass plays that Justin Fields has when he drops back and we're looking deep for DJ Moore or Tyler Scott or Darnell Mooney, perhaps even Claypool, I do think uh, he's he's a big one, but um, I'm also looking at Kyler Gordon. He finished off the year really well, um, but I do think he also needs to take another step because he was getting targeted in a lot of games last year. And so he needs to get to that point where QB start to fear him a little bit more and aren't looking at his number po- uh, pre-snap every play. For sure. No, that, may, that makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. I, I am curious, um, Max, talking with Max, uh, Markham, of the NFL content creation hub on Twitter, uh, done, doing some great stuff over there. So please check him out. Talking Chicago bears. Um, I, I am curious here, Max, what would you consider a successful season for the Chicago bears? If we are talking now going into the 2024 off season, what in your mind um, gets us to the point where we're excited about the Chicago bears uh, for the next upcoming season? Yeah, two major things. It comes down to our over or under that Vegas has set for us. It's about eight wins. And so if we get to eight wins, I'm I'm happy. I think we've taken that next step from being a first or the worst team in the league to middle of the pack. Maybe next year we can take another step. Um, the other thing is if Justin Fields looks like the guy, you know, and uh if one of those two things happens, I'm I'm very happy. More so for me, I'm just looking for Justin Fields to have a big passing year. And, uh, and if, so for me, a successful season is eight wins and Justin Fields being around, he, he doesn't even need to necessarily get to, but just being in the ball card of, ballpark of 4,000 passing yards in the ballpark range of 30 passing touchdowns yeah. in the ballpark range of 10 interceptions somewhere around there. I, I think that's the type of ju- uh, quarterback Justin Fields wants to be and that he could potentially be. Um, and I just hope last year, like, I don't know. It's uh he was very electric. I think he's gonna have a big rushing year as well. I think teams really fear him, and it's gonna give give him even more time to um, process his passing plays because they're always looking. Okay, he's got he's, he can break out. So let's instead of having a guy blitz, let's have a guy uh, QB spy that sort of thing. So I do think that Justin Fields needs to take that next step in a passing direction, and then get the Bears to eight wins, and and I'm happy. Yeah, going along that, if if you know part of the the thing of making a, a successful season is making sure Justin Fields is successful. You know, there's a name out there, DeAndre Hopkins. There's some other players still out there available. It doesn't have to be Hopkins, but if there was one guy 
available right now on the open market, offense, defense, you know, whatever special teams that you say to yourself, I'm not, I don't know why the bears aren't bringing that person into Hallis hall tomorrow for a workout here. Who is it? Who are you targeting? Who are you looking at that you think the bears should add before uh training camp really gets underway? Yeah, I think the easy answer is Yannick Ngakwe. He has previous history with Matt Eberflus, and I think that is the biggest concern going into the season is having a pass rusher um, that to replace Travis Gibson. I think he had his chance last year, and perhaps he can carve out a role this year, um, just being a rotational sort of pass rusher. Yeah. But he disappointed me with only three sacks, and you literally have nobody competing with you for for space they want you on the field they want you rushing on every passing down and uh, so adding someone like Yannick Ngakwe I know there's some concerns with his uh, um, run stuffing ability but I do think you brought in a couple of defensive linemen for that very purpose Andrew Billings and just well Justin Jones should be that guy as well but also Jervon Dexter should be entering into the defensive line and helping out with that so um, and then you have three linebackers that are very mobile, uh, very quick. Um, Noah Su- Sewell coming in as potentially uh, LB. You're high on him. You're very high on him from, from, from Twitter. The Penne Sewell's brother, uh, the linebacker out of Oregon, is um, is he a guy that could move Jack Sanborn back into the you know the back to the bench or or is he just a rotational guy? Um, I call this a hot take, but I'd be surprised if he didn't. I think I think he last year he was considered a first round pick and then he had kind of a down year and for whatever reason that um, might be whether that's a defensive scheme shift or maybe it's just uh, I, I don't know maybe defensive line you lost a few they lost a few guys and had some change up there um, or maybe he just got complacent and was just like I'm there already and didn't have as great of an offseason but I think he comes from a family that's a strong football family high character I think he uh, is going to put in the work this offseason and he's going to be a guy that's going to be tough to take off the field the one interesting thing with him though is he is so good at blitzing the quarterback and finding his gap and uh, and getting through with great burst and so I am wondering and I know we saw the offense have a shift and I'll just go back to one of our pieces of conversation earlier in the session is that um I want to see Matt Eberflus willing to adapt to his personnel as well. He's not a blitzing defensive head coach or defensive uh, coordinator or coaching. He doesn't like that scheme a whole lot. He wants his four rushers to rush and to be able to get to the quarterback. But when you have a guy like Noah Sewell on the, on the field, um, throw him in and he's going to get to the quarterback. And I think he would be a good guy to have, but yeah, going back to the current question, Yannick, Yannick Ngakwe should easily have 10 sacks. Like he has the last I don't know, four seasons in a row, he's had about 10 sacks per season. So I think adding in some sort of pass rush threat would just be just a smart move for the Bears. Eberflus knows him best, so if we pass on him, I trust him. But if we do pick him up, I think it's just a no-brainer. Yeah. All right, Max, before we let you go here, and we appreciate you for joining us, Max Markham, uh, NFL on Twitter. One of the, one of my big things is I, I am an eternal optimist. I I was I I'm in in this role of being in the sports media on my own on my own show on my on my uh, uh, radio station and on in this podcast I try I do try to take it out and just say you know give it all my you know give my fandom a rest and just an analytically but I do think the Bears are poised for a playoff run this year I really do I I think everything is lining up the NFC North is is just very open. There's, it's never been more unpredictable. The Vikings seem to be making moves like they're in a rebuild. The the Packers, we have no idea at all what offensively what Jordan Love will look like in, over the slog of 17 NFL games. We just have no idea. And uh, with the Lions, we expect them to be good. I, I expect the Lions to win the division, but that's a lot asking a team that hasn't won the division since, you know, I was two years old to win the division. So, um, all that being said, my expectation right now is the Chicago Bears make the playoffs. I want to hear from you. Do you think they make the playoffs? If so, why? And then really quickly, just at the end of it, add, if the Bears don't make the playoffs, this is why. If a year from now we're talking about the Bears, another season, another missed postseason, what went wrong for them this year to where they didn't make the playoffs? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so I do agree that the Lions are in the best position to win the division. I think the Vikings 
Um, I had the Vikings ahead of the Bears as of a few weeks ago, but man, they are just tearing down. And I don't really know what Kwesi Adolfo Mensa is doing there, the Minnesota's GM, because they sign Kirk Cousins to like a $35 million one year extension. But yeah. then they, so you're thinking, oh, they, they're going to go take a, another oh, run yeah. at it, you know? And then all of a sudden they start trading guys away. Uh, Zadarius Smith and now Daniel Hunter, I just saw this morning, he's officially a holdout and he's looking for a new contract. They're not on the same playing field. So apparently um, the Vikings are looking to trade him. And and so who knows what happens with that? I, I think there's a big culture shift there. You're losing some veteran guys that are necessary to having some sort of winning culture. So um, I don't know. I think the Vikings just took a step back. The Bears should they should be second in the division um however answering your question if we're looking back a year from now and we don't make the playoffs i do think i think it would come down to the defense i i don't see a reality where our offense is a problem um i think just justin fields that he's for much of last season when he had just a little bit of help they were scoring 30 points a game 30 points a game 28 27 you know like We've never on, seen anything like it in our lives as Bears fans. Like, no. oh. And during a tank season when you have no, like you're not expecting much. And then he was taking off. And so um, I don't expect him to have that same sort of um, run um, the rushing yards that he had last year, but I do expect them to take a step forward and just um, looking in. Uh, I think consistency would be the biggest thing I'm looking for for that offense. But uh, the biggest issue if we uh, struggle at all, it's going to be against the run. It's going to be our defensive line. Um, perhaps Drew Von Dexter or Zach Piggins aren't able to be reliable starters. Um, Justin Jones, he's he's decent, but Andrew Billings, he's not a big name either. And then just also our ability to get to the quarterback. So it's all going to come down to that defensive line um, if we don't get to it, which I don't know, gives me a little hesitation going to week one. I don't think Jordan Love necessarily will be the guy, especially starting off, but I think that they do have a really good running game. They have good offensive line in Green Bay. They still have Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon. Um, they they have some uh, good weapons there. But uh, I think if we lose even that game, that's going to be a um, a dictation of how the rest of the season will go, and it will be that we'll be beaten on in the defensive trenches. Yeah, that's a that's. In, uh, in, in an interesting take because I, I I actually like now that I'm thinking about it because Mark you have you haven't posed that question yet uh, on the show either like really trying to forecast what a bad season would look like even even if they you know stumble offensively throughout the year it, it'd be hard to envision that it was so bad that uh, the defense was doing everything they could but the offense wasn't pulling its way it just doesn't seem like that's a plausible scenario yeah uh in, in what happens with Chicago so yeah I mean it really is going to be can the defense just to help keep them in the game while the offense is scoring the points can you yeah. just get a couple key stops and uh, and you'll be good to go yeah injuries aside because you never know well, I mean sure. yeah, like yeah. obviously you know an injury and I'm not even going to say anyone's name or anything because I'm not even why don't want to add that juju in the world <laughs> But, you know, you take that away and you say to yourself, how do you not? To me, it's as simple as I agree with you. The defense it, letting up too much points and just putting too much pressure on the offense to become a passing offense as opposed to I think the passing offense and just fields getting to 4,000 will be because they run the ball so well. It it frightens everything and it opens up to one, good one-on-one -on -one matchups for their new weapons and their toys, and he they exploit that. Um, and, uh, you know – the other thing, the only other thing I could think of is that, that that somehow the Lions are just way better than we think, and they come out guns a blazing, and the Vikings, the Packers are are just as good as the Bears, and not better. And you never know, your division games break your your way or not. The Bears don't have the easiest schedule in the world. It's not tough, but there are some games you could say to yourself, well, if that one goes your your wrong way, and then you lose a divisional matchup, uh, then you are in some trouble record wise. So. I agree with you. Four, I think that 4,000 yard about Mark 30, about touchdowns passing uh, you, you keep it under two to one touchdown interception ratio with, with uh, Justin Fields. I'd be a very, very happy camper, especially if he makes it through the year completely healthy to show, Hey, he can do this and stay healthy through a year. That would just be electric. It'd be electric. 
Yeah, to really look forward to seeing a full season of what he can do for sure with Matt Eberflus and everything. Like you said uh, earlier, Max, there's really no excuses anymore. If he's healthy the full season, this is our chance to get that, you know, look at at what these Bears could be and what they should be moving forward. So, uh, Max, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you uh, coming here and talking Chicago Bears. Um, you know, one one final time for the viewers and listeners, uh, let us know where we can uh, see more of your work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, find me on Twitter at Max Markham NFL. And then uh, I do some YouTube videos occasionally as well. So if you want to just look up Max Markham on YouTube, um, I like to do highlights and some breakdowns here and there. But uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. I really appreciate talking about the Bears. And I think this is one of the biggest off seasons in Bears history. I know as far as my Bears fandom. So uh, that also means that this season is one of the most exciting because either we're going to have a franchise QB or else we're going to have some questions. <laughs> let's hopefully avoid that heartbreak once again yeah. <laughs> all right thank you so much max appreciate it that was great i mean max yeah, is yeah. uh thanks again to max for coming on and maybe we'll have to try to get him on throughout the season especially if things are going well for the bears and and, and our our premonitions well of 4, certainly 000. once fields hits four thousand, yes you know. is our our fields is, gets to four thousand uh guy for sure um, one thing we didn't get a chance to touch on, but I, I wanted to touch on just for, again, if we're already making this a Bears episode, talking so much Bears, uh, Naperville has entered the chat. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talked, uh, did we touch on it a little bit last week? I can't remember. I don't exactly. think we brought that up. No, I don't, I don't think that was uh, news quite yet um, but, before, before uh, we, we recorded our show. I'll just say this. Um, I well hold up real for for those listening that don't know the 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 bears are are, apparent, are apparently looking to to move elsewhere and not Arlington Park after yes. all of this well, they so, may very well be going to uh further north suburbs of well, Illinois <laughs> well possible. Naperville would just be straight west you know Arlington Heights is north. Oh I guess that's true yeah yeah Naperville yeah. straight west they're both about the same distance from the city um, they have the Naperville has the Amtrak stop, which would be convenient for me because and I have the land Amtrak from, uh, from Quincy. Yes. But I'll say this, the thing I love the most about this news is I don't care where the bears build their new mega stadium dome. that can get Chicago and, uh, final fours and help Chicago, like get an Olympics and do all the things that will put Chicago on the map where it should be as an event host city for the world. Uh, what they're, what they're going to be building. I, I, I don't care where they build it, but this is so indicative of the fact that there's a new leader of the bears, Kevin Warren, the president of the Chicago bears out with the old in with the new, he is capable and is willing to have these tough conversations that, you know, Ted Phillips in the last generation of that old stalwart of the Bears, they just weren't capable of handling it. And Warren is doing it. And I love it. I just love it because that's the type he was at Justin Fields' graduation. Like, this is the type of leader who's just like, no, like, they, we're the goddamn Chicago Bears. We are a top three, top five valued franchise in the NFL. And we barely win. Like, we need to be more aggressive. We need to sell our brand. This is about it. If, if anything, what, the, what, the, what this should lead to is the city of Chicago putting in a bid, just like Naperville, just saying, we get it. You want to leave Soldier Field? We will sell you, you know, um, the rest of M old Miggs Field, north of the island. Like, we will, what do you want? Like, let's make a deal. Like, I, I think this is exactly what the this this needs. And I still feel very confident the Bears will end up in Arlington Park, Arlington Heights, because the space is just the perfect amount of space. Right off the it highway. Right off the highway, right off the Metro line. Um, it is really idealistic for the Chicago land. Being only like 28 miles from downtown Chicago, it's perfectly situated, just like many of the other teams that aren't in, you know, the Dallas Cowboys aren't in Dallas. They, you know what I mean? Yeah, like they're, they're yeah. perfectly situated for a lot of how that'll work. But in the end, they have every right to threaten Arlington Heights not to go because they only spent like three and a half million dollars on the property. And that's a drop in the bucket to the Bears. And they'll use the property for something else or they'll flip it. 
You know what I mean? They'll just sell it or make condos or do something, and the, the family will still get rich off of it. So they have every Might do right. Training to, camp there. Yeah, know. they have every right to keep threatening um, Arlington Heights. And listen, the Bears have already committed themselves over a billion dollars towards the building. It's not like they want everyone to finance it. It's not the financing that's holding up. It's a lot of the taxes and that the way now the city's trying to get greedy here. And the Bears will look at the rest of the very wealthy Chicagoland suburbs going, who wants us? We're open for business. And I think you'll see, um, it wouldn't shock me if you'll see other, other suburbs get involved. And there are plenty of other suburbs, especially Lake County, um, that really could present quite a nice bid. Naperville, it's just great that it's Naperville being the first one because they are literally, if you're like us and you're from Chicago land, every other suburb hates Naperville and everyone in the city <laughs> hates Naperville because Naperville is the definition. They are global gym. They are better than us and they do know it. It is a lovely town. <laughs> it's a yeah, great, yeah. It's got a beautiful little river walk. It is very deserving of always being in that running as like one of the top 10 suburban towns in the world, in the country. It's great. Like it is, it is Crystal Lake on steroids where we're from as far as just being a terrific, well-run, great, high-end, upper middle class suburban town. Um, and so it is great for them to go if you're Arlington Heights and you don't want the Bears to move back to Chicago, you'd rather them move. Back to Chicago than Naperville. Because yeah. like losing it to Naperville is is that extra sting. That stings for sure. It is. It really yeah. is. And so um uh, that's our suburban Chicago land talk. I'll just say this. I love it. Like two, three years ago when the first news broke, remember, I was very anti the Bears leaving. But so much of this now is just opening my eyes to the fact that the Bears are becoming a well-run organization. They have a new president, the new blood in that organization gives me hope then maybe the McCaskies don't even have to sell and the Bears can turn it around and they can figure it out. Uh, and that's, as a fan, how I feel right now. Again, I will get this feeling for the next 10 years till they actually start playing in this new stadium and they'll probably still be the same old Bears and stink. But I get 10 years of hoping before that happens. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You <laughs> still get to keep that intact. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a very important part, you know, for those uh, Crystal Lake peeps out there. Quick shout out. Kenbird Park, Lippold Park, I think fantastic places. Build it. For they the will Chicago come. Bears to come. That's right. That's right. There's a Tommy's nearby. Yeah. Uh, you know, movie theater, Costco. I mean, that's all you need for all those. Paul Hespin will find you at homes for all the players out there. <laughs> yes, like he will. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Perfect stuff there. Um, all right. Well, that will do it uh, for this episode. Thanks again to Max Markham for uh, that great interview. And coming up next week, Chris Sims completed his. What was it? Top 40? Top 40. List? We have some issues. So that's coming up next week. So stay tuned for that. But for now, he's Mark. I'm Dan. This has been the Football Lounge. Mm-hmm.